Amazing. Okay, so we have started <laughs> recording and Ty, the floor is yours. All right, so as Ellen mentioned, my name is Ty. Uh, my full name is Tamik, but um, my mom here, she made the, diff uh, the spelling a little difficult. Um, so I just go by Ty for short to make it easy on everybody. Love you, mom. Um, but um, so I'm here to talk about adversity, overcoming adversity. So um, at 29, I had a brain, a hemorrhagic brainstem stroke due to a leak in a from a cavernous malformation, which is an abnormal cluster of blood vessels in the brain uh, that I was born with. Um, it's genetic. My brother has it. My uncle has it. Um, so for for me at 29, um, I thought I was in, pretty much invincible, invis, invincible, um, just living life, what I would say, leading life selfishly just after career and uh, my personal gain had just graduated college and gotten well into my career. And um, one day I'm preparing for my engagement photo shoot and I feel that my balance is off. Um, my vision was off and I, I champed it through the engagement shoot with my now wife. And I remember on our way home, I mentioned she asked that I want to go to the hospital because there was a hospital right down the street from the school. Said, uh, I just want to go home and get something to eat and take a nap. And if I don't feel well when I wake up, then I can go. You can take me to the hospital. So I, she she orders food. I take two bites and then I go to sleep. This is where it gets interesting. I had a dream where a figure came to me. So I'm spiritual. So I, as soon as the figure came, I figured it to be God. So she said, do you trust me? I said, absolutely. She said, OK, so well, we have to go. I instantly woke up and I tapped my wife and I said, hey, we got to go to the hospital. And um, we went to the hospital and they ran out my, the, the left side of my body was numb by that point. Um, and I had no balance and my vision was very blurry. So they immediately took me in the back and run tests. I had a CAT scan, um, which they deemed that I had, they found a mass on my brain uh, because the imaging wasn't, wasn't clear enough. So we had to go for MRI where they discovered that I had the cavernous malformation. So when the doctor came into the room to give me the, the news of the diagnosis that he saw the mass, um, I seen that same figure from my dream and it, and it said, remember that I have you covered. So I knew that I was gonna be fine all along. Um, it, this was just gonna be a journey. Um, so from there, I spent a week in the hospital. Uh, I got an MRI that, uh, my mom and my wife kind of pushed for it because the hospital was kind of taking their sweet time a little bit. Uh, so my mom put a little pep in their step. I got an MRI and it came back that I had I had a multiple cavernous malformations. Uh, so my problematic one was at the brainstem. So it impacted the left, the left side of my body and the right side of my face. So I had Bell's palsy um, where I had to droop for a month or so. I couldn't I closed my eyes. So in some pictures you see me post, um, if you follow me, I had to wear an eye patch for about a month because I couldn't close my eye all the way to keep moisture in. Um, I couldn't, I really was bedridden for about three weeks. So after my hospital stay for a week, I was transferred to a inpatient rehab facility called St. Lawrence Rehab Rehabilitation Center. And I was there for three weeks and I had to complete occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy round the clock. I think I had two sessions a day for three weeks straight. And uh, it was intense, but it was worth it. Um, so after that three weeks, I was discharged to come home and I've been an outpatient ever since. So I'll be celebrating my four years of recovery in June. So if I didn't mention that happened June 5th of 2019, and I was 29 years old. Um, now I'm 33. And uh, I'll be celebrating four years of, of recovery um, in June. And um, I overcame, the diagnosis was of a brain stem, hemorrhagic brainstem stroke is 26% survival rate. So one in every four people. So I, I beat those odds. And then of that 25 or 26%, only 10% of people, they say, make a uh, full recovery, which I was able to. I'll say this is a lifelong recovery, but I made a significant recovery. Um, so I, I, I battled against those odds. And I want to say that, you know, I didn't want to be a statistic. And I don't believe in the statistics that the doctors give if you believe in yourself. 
Um, so I'm still currently, uh, you know, as I'm approaching four years out, I still do physical therapy. I still do occupational therapy. And I spend a lot of my time doing advocating for our us fellow stroke survivors to um, to just create awareness for uh, for doc to doctors and just for our conditions of uh, and be a voice for people who might not feel comfortable standing up for them, themselves. Um, so that's my that's my story there, and I can jump into overcoming adversity. So that was I would say I thought I knew what adversity was from playing basketball. So I was a college athlete and sometimes the games were rough and I thought that I knew what adversity was, but clearly this taught me I knew nothing about it, about what adversity truly meant. This was my most, the most adversity I've ever faced in my life. Um, and it shifted my perspective. So as I mentioned, I, I felt that I led a selfish life thinking about myself and my career um, and, and my personal gain. And after having a stroke, I became more selfless. So I feel that I'm more about how many people I can impact while I'm here instead of my own personal gain. So for me, it's all about works and this is why I do what I do. Um, but to start as far as my stroke takeaways and overcoming adversity, my first thing is that I knew God had to be covered. Um, so I stood in faith, um, which help me to overcome some and I know everybody isn't spiritual so that that's you know my personal takeaway um but the biggest thing outside of spirituality to me is understanding your why so if you don't know if you know your why to me things are things become easier if you don't know your why things can be a little more difficult and what I mean by that is I knew my why you know my family um you know as you see my mom here um my mom was there every day. My wife was there every day. Um, and so my family was one of the big reasons why of my, my why, which made it easy to wake up every day and to attack therapy and to just want to get better. Um, so if you know your why, even on the hard days, you just think about your why and it, it helps to it helps you to get in rhythm on on the hard task. So for me, did I want to get up every day and go to therapy? No, I didn't. But seeing my mom there and even when she wasn't or my wife there and just thinking about them during the recovery process and my the rest of my family and my belief in myself, it was just it just made it easier to get up and attack therapy every day um, and to stay consistent. Um, the next thing is to just rise to the occasion. Um, this Having a stroke or, or facing any adversity um, can be can be scary, um, and it's all about rising to the occasion and believing in yourself. So, uh, for me, it was all about proving myself right. I was never out to prove the doctors wrong or say, "Hi, I told you so." It was just my belief in myself that I would heal and I would recover, and to prove myself right. Um, and I feel that comes from a positive connotation as opposed to a negative. Proving someone wrong to me, it's kind of like a negative. I'm, I'm just out to prove you wrong. No, I believed in myself so much to rise to the occasion that I wanted to prove myself right. Um, and you have to believe in yourself. Uh, there was points in times where I didn't believe in myself and my confidence was kind of low. And I actually fell into a, um, a deep depression. I was, I was diagnosed last December with, uh, severe um, depressive disorder or major depressive disorder I'm sorry um, and it it was a year-long journey to this December when I went back to the psychiatrist and my only lingering mental health issues I would say were PTSD and anxiety from from the stroke uh, so I was able to to just believe in myself and get comfortable in myself to to overcome the depression, uh, I began to love myself again. And how did I do that? I stood in the mirror, I looked at myself, made myself, got myself comfortable with myself and just did things that I enjoyed doing to remind me of who I was, but also to show me who I'm becoming. Um, and when, when you show up for yourself, you wanna show up with, a, and you wanna work relentlessly, right? So you don't want to just show up to therapy or whatever adversity you're going through and go through the motions. So for me, I'll make an analogy to basketball, right? So in practice, I could come down and I can just walk through the play. 
Um, but I'm not doing myself any justice or making my team any better if I'm just walking through. I need to come in and give a high energy, a high effort um, in order to impact the change on myself and on my team to make those better around me. So for me, I, I showed up every day and I work relentlessly, even to this day. Um, when I go to therapy, my therapists are happy to see me because I challenge them as much as they challenge me. So it's a challenge for them to come up with a plan for as advanced as they they deem me. Uh, so they're, as soon as I leave, they're game planning for my next session. And they say <clears throat> they say that it makes it fun yeah, for them. It's not here. Um, they say that it makes it fun for them uh, to, to be able to, that I challenge them in a way that I do. And it's because I, I, I show up and I work relentlessly. I also rest. Rest is an important part of, of um, recovery and facing adversity too. I know we, we live in a culture, a hustle culture where it's, hey, you have to grind, you have to work relentlessly, you know, and take no days off. And I believe the total opposite. You rest when you need to. You work hard every you work hard as much as you can and that you work hard you give a hundred percent of yourself every day and that looks different every day but you have to honor your body when it tells you to rest no matter if it's a stroke or whatever kind of adversity you're, you're facing um give yourself credit uh that's the next thing i know for me i didn't give myself a lot of credit until i was two to three years out that first year you know, this to, in my mind, it was what I was supposed to do. So I never gave myself credit for being able to relearn how to tie my shoes, relearning how to walk, relearning to uh, relearning to to talk and just do different things, relearning to write. I never gave myself credit for that. And it took to get into a community to say, hey, wow, I relearned how to tie my shoes. I relearned how to write. Um, I relearned how to walk. And each day I might walk a different amount but I can walk now I'm proud of myself I never thought that I would be able to get back out on the basketball court and if you see some of my recent videos I've been able to uh, to to train for basketball um and the next thing in facing adversity is go at your own pace right you know everybody everybody has their own journey there they have their own lane if we're thinking about a highway everybody has a unique individual lane so don't look to your left and don't look to your right because and don't compare because everybody has their own speed and their own journey. Um, I, one story I remember my high school, unfortunately, my high school track coach, he passed from from a stroke. Um, but I remember one thing that he taught me, I was running my first ever race and in track, there's eight lanes and the race that I was running, it was a half a lap. And you don't start lined up next to each other. It's staggered. So I was in lane eight in front of everybody. So I couldn't see anybody. And he said, don't look for anybody. Just keep your eyes on your lane and to the finish line. And so I said, okay, the gun went off and we start running and I was out in front of everybody. And it was so uncomfortable. I couldn't see anybody. I couldn't hear anybody. And so I turned to look. And as soon as I did, everybody passed me and I lost. And from that moment on, I took away that I just need to focus on my own lane and my own journey because I have my own pace. I don't work at anybody else's pace. Um, and I, me, I'm an outlier. I like to march to my own, the beat of my own drum. So um, they they consider me, a, I guess, a rule bender or, you know, but I just like being free and, and following, knowing that the decision I made was was best for me. And lastly, to overcome adversity is have fun, you know, do the things that you like to do. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that um, when they face adversity to do the things that they actually love to do that fills their spirit and um, can just help to keep them going. So I know for me, I got away from a lot of the things that I like to do um, in my first two years. And this last year, I spent a lot of time rediscovering myself and what I what I actually like to do. And so I've gotten into traveling more. I've gotten back into playing basketball. I plan to try and pick up golf this spring. So just trying new new and different things and, and to just have fun in life, uh, just doing the things that, that you enjoy doing. So those are my takeaways uh, for how to overcome adversity. And that's my personal, my personal journey and what I did to help myself overcome adversity.
That was and, awesome. Oh, Amazing. It, and Sorry. I was going to say, see, and one thing that I forget about that I don't give myself credit to is I became an author through all of this. Um, and that's one thing that I kind of forget about. Um, I wrote a book um, called Becoming a Light, Navigating Darkness After a Stroke. And it was therapeutic for me. Um, but I kind of forget to give myself credit sometimes. So that's something that I'm still working on. Uh, but yeah, to end, that was those are my my takeaways on how to overcome adversity. Awesome. That was fantastic. And I'm going to pull a little bit more out of you too. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the book and I'm so happy that you did. Actually, I'd love to share a link to uh, where people can find the book. Um, if you we can, so you can send it to me via email after and I'd love to share it with everybody. The other sure. thing I want to pull out of you is um, can you talk a bit about your business and what's going on with that? I think, does your brother also have a business? Have you guys like joined up? Can you just talk a little bit about that too? So um, I'm actually wearing a shirt. Uh, so we have, a, I don't want to call it a brand, uh, but I like to call it a community. So it's called To The T and it started, the name came from both me and my brother's name, uh, Tamika and Tehran. So it just started out as something playful. And uh, my brother, as I mentioned, he had a cavernous malformation. He actually had a stroke at the age of four, I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, my mom could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was four. So he was very, he was very young and uh, it caused him to live with epilepsy. So we kind of just look, it became first epilepsy, uh, epilepsy awareness um, kind of brand and, and community. And then at 29, when I had the stroke, then we figured, okay, well, let's, let's raise awareness for all things brain, um, you know, for brain, the mind, body, and, and spirit. So um, for us now, it's an all-inclusive community and safe space for, you know, for, for anybody, um, especially those who have dealings with, uh, you know, any brain events, as I call them, uh, whether you, you are directly impacted or, or a caregiver, um, and we're, we're right now and we're in the beginning phases, um, just raising awareness for, oh, yep. She said I was correct. Four years, four years old. Um, but we're raising awareness, as I mentioned, for, for everything, for all brain health. And, um, this is why I do what I do. And so we have, we're going to be having merchandise, uh, so you can feel a part of the community. Um, and we're just going, for me, I don't, it's hard to put into words how big I want this to be. Um, but I just want to impact the community using my platform of basketball um, and my social following the best that I can. And my brother, you know, my brother is, he, we do work together, um, but he's still not in a place of comfort to be out there and um, promote his story as much as I do, which, you know, is understandable. So I just try to coach him and help him as much as possible. And I tell his story for him. <laughs> you know, uh, just to, just to raise awareness for, for epilepsy and, and, and support my brother. Sounds like you and your brother have a really awesome partnership. That's really cool. Yeah. We're like, it's funny because when people see us together, they think we're twins. Um, we get that a lot. I remember we were at the supermarket and he walked down the aisle and then I walked down the aisle and the lady was like, I just saw you in another aisle. And I was like, oh no, that was probably my brother. Um, so yeah, we're eight years apart, um, but you couldn't tell if you were with us because we're as close as probably twins could be. Um, so it just makes our dynamic and work that much easier. That's awesome. I love it. Now, if you guys couldn't notice, I've been, uh, or if you didn't notice in the chat, I've been typing some really great things that Ty was saying um, that just really stood, stood out to me. And I wanted to make sure those kind of lived a bit more, uh, more permanently with us for the remainder of the session. So um, I love at the beginning, you said knowing your why helps you get a rhythm to do hard tasks. Because at the end of the day, anything and I, I, I didn't make this up. I've heard it tons before and maybe you all have too. Anything worth fighting for never comes easy. Is that it? Um, and so I just loved, loved that. And then you also said, I'm not out to prove others wrong. I'm out to prove myself right. 
that stuck with me so much. Um, and I, I think that's because I have that mindset a lot. I personally want to prove other people wrong. And, and I agree with you, like how much better does it feel? At least it feels a lot better to me when I just switch it a little and think, no, no, I just want to prove myself right. I know I can do these things. Just focus on me, stay in my lane, like, which was an awesome analogy, by the way, I never heard it. I love it. Um, yeah, that, that was great. And then the third thing I wrote down that you said was when you show up for yourself, you want to work relentlessly. Um, I'd like to think I work hard. Um, I think all people can. Um, and so that just kind of was, was a great motivation for me. And I hope it acts as motivation for everybody else in this chat too. So um, if anybody, if you guys have been in these groups before, you know, I like to talk and I always have questions, but now is my time to sort of silence and mute myself. And if anybody else has questions, please, I encourage you to unmute your microphone and um, you can go ahead and ask Ty. And just another reminder, we're still recording. If you wanna save a question for after the recording, that's no problem too. Hi, Ty. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I just want to ask you, if you don't mind sharing, what um, your recovery journey has been like since the brain injury and like what has your neurosurgeon said about maybe removing the cavernous malformation or if it's still there? So uh, you said my, I know that's a, that's a two part. So you want to know about my, uh, like my recovery journey? Yeah. If you um, still experience any symptoms. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I, I present well, but I still experience, um, I still experience symptoms. So I, I have double vision still. Um, I have what's called hypercussis where I have sound sensitivity in my left ear. Um, I get sensory overload. So if all my senses are working at the same time, my body kind of just starts to shut itself down and I have to go to a quiet place uh, to just regroup for about 10 or 15 minutes. Still experience brain fatigue, uh, the neuro fatigue. That's probably my biggest most impactful I would say deficit that I still have because um you know it, it's it's so random I don't know when I'm going to get tired and I, I it's it feels different than being sleepy it's it's my body just kind of shuts down and I have to listen to it um I still have a lack of sensation on the left side so it's hard for me to tell temperature um in my left hand but that's it's all getting better um and I just have some some muscle tightness, so tone as they call it, uh, that I'm working through to release some tightness in my shoulder and in my hamstring. As far as as the neurosurgeon goes, so ironically, I had a neurosurgery appointment last week. I'm looking at the calendar. I believe last Tuesday I had a neurosurgery appointment where it was the first time that surgery was the removal of it was, was presented. So why there were two options prior to removal, which was leave it alone or gamma knife. And because my condition is hereditary, um, gamma knife could replicate the cavernous malformation uh, gene, which could cause more of them to occur. So they ruled that out. Um, now, the neurosurgeon recommended surgery to prevent to a hundred to give a hundred percent chance of no no rebleed because right now as it stands I believe that the odds are 70 percent of no bleed again and 30 percent chance that it could um but surge brain surgery leaves me with the risk of permanent deficits of like double vision and um just different things that could impact my hearing my vision and my facial uh, my facial muscle control. So I opted against having surgery. Um, and my, my neurologist, they just want to manage, help me manage my symptoms unless something changes with my quality of life, because they feel that the progression I made over the last three years could be negated by surgery. And I honestly don't know if I'm mentally prepared to re-embark on the journey of relearning how to walk and talk again. 
Thank you. Um, I'm asking because I actually had the same thing happen to me. I had a cavernous malformation that mm -hmm. bled. Um, and right now, the they just want to like monitor it. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, don't you, do you ever feel like scared that I might bleed again? I used to, um, and I I shifted my, I had to shift my mindset because I would think it would be nights where I would lay down like, man, if, if what happens if this bleeds again? And I live with that for, for a bit of time. And I realized that I don't know how many years are you, you're out or what your time frame is, but the more time that has passed for me, the more comfortable I have grown with it being there because it hasn't caused me any new issues. And I use my brother as a reference. So my brother had a bleed at four and hasn't had a bleed again. And he's 26 or 25. Um, so I look at that. I look at his track record to kind of help me stay focused that, hey, you know, if I live in fear of this thing and I let it consume me, then I'm not living my life and I'm not having fun. Um, but I do understand your, your sentiments uh, because I have been there. Uh, but what I can say is just try to do things, you know, get get to yourself and do things that you enjoy doing and don't let that overwhelm you. Um, do what you enjoy doing, but also express your concerns uh, within the community, uh, you know, have a friend that you can express this to. Uh, you know, my wife is one of my my wife is my in-home therapist and my mom is my out-of-state therapist so I talk to them every day and I just I'm just open about what I feel like hey I'm tired today or I had a little headache but I can tell the difference um but I did live in fear but I don't anymore thank you you're welcome I want to say thank you, Sim, for being so honest. Um, but I guess time, it just worked out that now you have somebody who you can look up to and, you know, reference and his story and you're here today and he's here today. And yeah, thank you for, for being so honest and asking those questions. This is the space to do that. And we're all here to support each other. So thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, if you'd like to ask a question while we're still recording, feel free to do so. I'll pause for a little bit and feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, if not, I will ask a couple questions um, while we're still recording. Hi, Ty. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so I too had a hemorrhagic stroke and uh, my question, you sort of answered it, but I'm still a little bit unclear uh, as to your physical deficits. I know you said you had some less visible deficits. And the reason why I ask about your physical deficits is because uh, I was extremely active running half marathons every weekend and, and just I loved manual labor. And I'm still dealing with um, the paralysis on the, left side and I have the goal to return to run which sort of like you I've exceeded all their physical expectations you know but um I'm very excited tomorrow I go see a specialist and I'm really hopeful he's a gait specialist so I'm really hopeful that he'll give me the exercises that I need to do to get me back to running so for physical deficits what would you say still linger do i need and sorry can you remind me how long ago your stroke was so my stroke was june 5th of 2019 so almost four it'll be four years uh in june uh physically um i would say that i have trouble like my my muscles some of my muscles don't co weren't coordinating properly so my brain wasn't sending the right signal for me to to properly run so my gait was was slightly off as well um, in my shoulder, um, I have like some shoulder tightness. Um, and so I have like um, deficits as far as like finger speed, dexterity and things like that. So writing, typing, uh, but with running, um, my leg, my hamstring 
it wasn't receiving the signal to contract the, the right signal. So, um, and it also fatigued very quickly. So I had to do a lot of uh, e-stem uh, for it to, and do exercises with the stem on so my brain could kick in and remember like, hey, this is the action that we're supposed to take. Right. Um, so for me, I had to to go to a number of different therapists because I got kicked out of the door a lot because I walk in and they're like, oh, well, you're very advanced. And um, then if a therapist isn't really in tune with what they do or love what they do, it's you're going to get the bare minimum. So for me, as I mentioned, advocate for yourself. I I will switch doctors in a heartbeat. Um I will I will change doctors in a heartbeat to uh find what I need. Um so I've changed I recently changed my neurologist and my and uh my neurology team because they were pushing me to go back to work and I still don't feel ready to engage in the kind of work that I was doing. So what going to a gait specialist definitely could help um because where I go it's a sports medicine facility um and they have anti-gravity treadmills which allows you to walk and run without having the full weight of your body so they can adjust it um so i would say look into a facility like that um you know but just keep searching and keep advocating you know just google is a great tool you know just kind of search for your area um for what you're looking for and i'm sure something or or something along the lines of what you're looking for will pop up and just kind of go down that rabbit hole um but just never give up because it's a ton of doctors out here that do care you just gotta unfortunately do your research to find the right one right thank you you're welcome Thanks, Heather. That was a great question. Thanks yep. for your answer, Ty. You're welcome. And I'll mention, like, you know, I, why I changed doctors was because I had I was experiencing symptoms with like my sweat, where I would sweat on half of my body, and it would take my the other half of my body longer to sweat. Um, my my light sensitivity and things like that. So I was recently diagnosed with two other rare conditions outside of the the cavernous malformation, which are called Wallenberg syndrome and Horner syndrome. And that's because I had to do my research and then take it to the doctors. And I find, I found a lot of the doctors that I asked had no idea what it was until I've met my new neurology team and they knew exactly what it was and how to help treat it. So even four years out, I'm still searching for, for care um, in the right care. So it doesn't, to me, it's a lifelong journey. And as long as you're willing to put in the time, invest the time into yourself, you know, the resources are out there. I guess, sorry, that's the other thing. I don't know if there are others in this group, but I'm sure there are who, you know, when your stroke first happens, you're so um, focused on the time element. And uh, like you said, I guess it is a lifelong journey and I just have to put that time component to the side. Mm-hmm. But it takes so freaking long, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. And that's what, what I tell people is when you focus on the time, that's when it gets difficult. So I, I focus and it because the doctors tell us you have to recover in this first year or else you aren't going to see any gains. I'm almost four years out and I just relearned how to dribble a basketball. So if I listened to them, I wouldn't have picked up a basketball. I would have just said, hey, I'm, I've reached my maximum two years ago. And that's that. But as long as you're willing, you know, you keep your mind positive and you're willing to retrain your brain, um, your brain will listen to you. It'll t it takes time. It takes time. But your brain, your brain will listen. I think you're on mute if you're talking. Sorry, you were just unmuted for the last thing you said, Heather, if you want to repeat it. Oh, it was, a, it was a silly joke just saying that I'm sure my brain, I'll have more success retraining my brain than getting my my 2019 and 18 year old sons to obey me and do what they're told. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to keep track of that. <laughs> yeah, I'll check in on that one. <laughs>
That's awesome. If they were anything like me, I would say so. <laughs> I wasn't too difficult, but I know what teenage boys, um, I've been a teenage boy, so I know yeah. what that, that entails. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for the question, Heather. And thanks for your answer, Ty. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I actually wanted to add to that. Um, Heather, I don't know. If, are you on Instagram? I'm not. I'm I'm too old to. I've done a few TikTok posts, hopefully to inspire some other people, but that's mm -hmm. even then half them don't work out, but I'm not on Instagram. Well, Ty, do you have any other social media other than Instagram? Because I think I, I just shared I'm on, face. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. So it's my name, first name. So I'm putting it in the chat with my full name, uh, which will show up on Facebook. And you'll see it'll be a picture of my wedding. Um, I'm also putting my email. Um, so if you want to, anybody here wants to send an address, I can send. I know I said told Sam I would send her a book. Um, but if you send your address, um, the book officially, well, re-releases in June of this year for my four-year recovery. But um, since we're here in this group, uh, and it's always a special spot in my heart for uh, fellow survivors, um, if you send me your address in the email, I'll get a book out to you. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. You're welcome. It's amazing. Um, and the reason I brought up your social media is because I'm on Instagram and I love your posts. So if anybody here is on Instagram, I encourage you to follow Ty, check out his Facebook, um, because you're always like a lot of your posts are you doing therapy mm -hmm. and it's just like, hey, like when I watch it, it's like, okay, you are doing something hard. Obviously, this is hard, but you're still doing it. And yeah. that's kind of a reference to what you said at the beginning of this of your talk is um, when you find out your why it helps you gain a rhythm to do hard things. And that is really what you're exemplifying on social and like your brand. And I just, it's really inspiring. I, I really love it. So uh, you thank you. Follow. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll go. Anybody? No, no. I guess it's your turn. It's my turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's see. Um, one thing that's not really a question, it's just something I wanted to call out because I appreciate you saying it. And I, it's um, almost unfortunate that I find it to be a, a pattern in every session that we have when we have a speaker. And that is um, you had to get your mom and your wife to push for that MRI because mm -hmm. the hospital was taking their sweet old time. Um, and I just, I, I call it out every time I hear it. So it's repetitive and I know we all know it, but just hearing it again and again, just, I want to make sure people are really advocating for themselves. And I'm so happy that your mom and your wife did that for you um, because obviously it helped. Yeah, it did. It did. And uh, it taught me to advocate for myself now in appointments. So I go into appointments prepared. So I, I think doctors dread seeing me because um, I come with an, <laughs> I come with uh, with printouts and notes and everything just with, based on what I'm feeling so I can discuss it um, and bring it up. So, um, yeah, advocate for yourself. Um, and with your doctors, it should be um, a two way it should be a two way street. It shouldn't be a dictatorship, um, you know, or one way avenue that they're just giving you information. They should be listening to you as well um, to help you come up with a with a a plan that you feel comfortable with. Um, not just telling you something this will allow you to feel better. So, in my last appointment, my doctors they really sat down to make sure that I understand understood the new things that they were trying to show me that I hadn't that I hadn't seen before or been that hadn't been mentioned. So uh, if it was a new medicine or they recommended Botox or even the surgery, it was, hey, all right, so maybe after you get your next MRI, we have an appointment with your whole family um, where they come in and we sit down and, and make you comfortable. And I can appreciate that, though I, I opted against surgery, I still appreciate the effort that they showed to make me comfortable um, 
to understand what new was going to happen in my life. Awesome. Thank you. So I see Sarah with a hand up here. Hi, Shai. Hey, Sarah. I just wanted to, it's kind of um, a few questions, but all along the same lines. Um, sorry, are you from the States? Oh, uh, yes, I'm from the States. I live in New Jersey. I'm okay. from Philadelphia, but I live in New Jersey. Okay. Um, just wondering, I'm in Canada, so I know our health care is a little different here. Mm -hmm. um, but just wondering in terms of um, like switching doctors and and whatnot. Um, I also, my biggest struggle right now is the, the neural fatigue, which you'd mentioned. Mm -hmm. And essentially I've been told by um, the quote unquote stroke doctor that the stroke isn't like the reason or the cause for the, the neural fatigue. So I'm kind of just wondering like how you sort of, I guess, navigate yourself like through the, through the healthcare system. Uh, so if, so with the, the healthcare system for me is if I feel seen and heard, I'll stick around. Um, or until I feel like there's more that I need. Um, and then I'll kind of seek out additional, additional resources. Um, but as far as like my fatigue goes, I, my doctor's, I don't think there's any there's much that they can really do for it. It's more that I have to adjust and adapt my lifestyle to the fatigue for right now. Um, so I test myself on some days. I push myself to um, through the fatigue, but most days I schedule in a nap. So I'm a big nap person these days. So if you ask my mom, she'll say she'll say, "Oh, are you about to go take a nap?" Yes. Um, but as far as navigating that the healthcare, I don't try to bounce around too much um because for me is always hard like goodbyes are hard for me so um when I have to switch doctors is more so because I have to more so than I want to um and it just comes down to and before I switch doctors I'm doing a lot of research on my next doctor before I just up and go so I'll keep my old doctor around and I'll schedule an appointment with the new one so as of so when I had my appointment last Thursday with my new neurologist I still had an appointment for this, for today with my old neurologist until I felt comfortable enough to cancel my current appointment. So I kind of navigate it like that, uh, but I only switch if I have to. It's a really um, interesting point and question that you brought up, Sarah. Thank you so much for asking it and presenting it to Ty and the rest of us in the group. I, I am not a doctor and I am not sure what sort of science or testing that your doctor's doctor did to, you know, make the determination that it wasn't the stroke leading to neuro fatigue. Um, but what I can say is that um, I am trying to go through a really deep dive with what sort of food I eat and how that can be causing lots of brain fog and fatigue. Um, so I know lots of people are just seeking out naturopathy right now. I'm trying to find naturopathic doctors. Um, that might be one thing that you also might want to try. And so my final question for you, Ty, is we're, we're talking about working hard and pushing yourself and also taking naps and recognizing neural fatigue. Do you ever push yourself too hard and think, oh man, like I set myself up for failure here because now I, I'm wiped out and I can't do anything or like, how do you determine what's pushing too hard and when you need that break? Um, I used to push too hard last year. I remember I went on a trip um, to, we went from New York to Washington, DC, and it took me two weeks to recover. Um, because I just, I would sleep all day and I couldn't gain my energy back. So I knew I had overdone it. Um, so now I listen to, uh, I'm just very in tune with my body. So um, I'll push when, when I feel I have more to give, but if my body, if I feel 
I, it's just a feeling that I have that I know like, okay, I should probably slow it down now or I have more to give. And even I know it's tricky for my mom and for my wife because I'll do a lot of things and they're like, hey, you need to rest. And I'm like, I still have energy. I'm OK. Um, so, I mean, I have a support system that's kind of in tune with they know because I'm open. Uh, so they understand like, hey, I might need to give them a warning to slow down. But then I get feedback like sometimes I'll say, all right, yeah, I do need to slow down or I'm OK. Uh, so, for instance, last weekend or maybe two weeks ago or so, I went on a, so the last few weekends I had traveled. So one weekend I went to Atlanta and it was, a, I went to a conference on a Friday and a Saturday and I built in a day of rest on Sunday. So before coming back home Monday. And so Sunday I, I was in Atlanta, I wanted to go to the football game, but I said, I'll play it by ear. So if I feel good when I wake up, I'll go. If I don't, I'll just rest today. I felt good when I got up and I went to the game. The next weekend, we traveled to Virginia to visit family. I drove all the way there. But on the way back, I only drove I drove halfway because I, my body said, OK, we have to we have to stop. So um, my body gives me signs, whether it's with my vision um or my yeah it's nine times out of ten is with my vision once I start my eyes start to bother me then I know it's time for me to either take a nap um or to just rest all in all and for me sometimes a nap is as quick as 15 minutes I'll go take I'll go lay down for 15 minutes and I feel like I got five six seven hours of sleep it's a great answer and I appreciate it so much I, uh, it's so important to just be listening to your body because your body is telling you things. And if you're not aware, um, and then you're pushing it to do stuff it doesn't want to do. So that's awesome that you continue to listen to your body and kudos to you. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, I'll pause for one more second. Feel free to unmute yourself if you do want to ask another question on the recording. If not, we'll stop the recording um, and then we will open it for another discussion. So I'll pause here. Okay. Um, so right before I stop the recording, I just wanted to say how appreciative I am of Ty for coming to our support group today. Very last minute, I should add, um, and just really knocking it out of the park. You did a phenomenal job and I can tell your, I haven't read your book, but it's probably also phenomenal um, because you're a great speaker. And I think writing is just speaking in words like written down and, and vice versa. Um, so thank you so much again. And I definitely recommend you guys send Ty an email and uh, get a hold of that book. Yeah, even if you're in Canada, it's ways to get it to you. Amazing.